friends, panellists. Uh, as Vice-Chancellor of the University of London, can I welcome you all most warmly tonight to this wonderful location here at the National Gallery of Singapore. I'm delighted that so many uh, of you joined us. Uh, we're collaborating tonight with British Council, who are celebrating the anniversary of 70 years in Singapore. And this event has been organized as part of their Knowledge is Great. Well, we'll discuss later on whether it is or isn't, but Knowledge is Great campaign. Um, and we're also delighted to be partnering with one of our federal partners in London, Royal Holloway, uh, this evening. So just a tiny bit about the university and background. Uh, the university, as many of you will know, has an unrivaled record as a pioneer in education, first to award degrees in England without religious tests, first to promote teaching and research in laboratory science and engineering, modern languages, first in the UK to admit women to full degrees, first to appoint a female professor, first in the Commonwealth to appoint a female vice-chancellor. Uh, we are also the world's oldest provider of academic awards through distance and flexible learning. Uh, dating back to a charter we received in 1858. And we're very proud to have continued this innovative model of education, uh, which now supports more than 52,000 students in over 180 countries studying for a University of London degree through our international programs. And in addition, we've got well over 1.3 million now who are studying short courses, MOOCs, through our, the Coursera online, online platform. In London itself, the university is now a federation of 18 independent partner institutions, some of whom have, are represented, have alumni here tonight, in particular Royal Holloway is with us. Our own School of Advanced Study is recognized as a national center for the support and promotion of world-leading research in the humanities. So whatever part of the university you are linked to or not, whether it's the central university or one of the partner uh, federal institutions, uh, one of the purposes of tonight is to encourage you to keep in touch with us. If you want to hear more about what we're doing in the future, I think there's a keep in touch contact card so you can fill in at the registration desk. Afterwards, we're going to circulate and have some, some drinks and something to eat. And, and please pass on information to any member of the staff who you bump into. Uh, we're about to launch uh, something, you were given a brochure tonight, which is called the Vice Chancellor's Circle. So it's like my circle. Um, one, of the, one of the ambitions we have, of course, is to open up access uh, to, yeah, I'm sorry about the photograph. Um, <laughs> open up access to the wonderful stuff that's available through the University of London and the Federation to as many people around the world as possible. And clearly for some, there are financial and other obstacles. And so for us, it's really important to have some kind of fund so that we can say to people who are in trouble, have hardship, possibly dropping out of courses, that we can try and help them. So do have a look at the leaflet and feel free to ask any colleagues about further information. So on to the debate this evening. Uh, it's the role of experts in what many people are now calling the post-truth world. We'll see what all that means later. Um, it's a very broad topic, but one I think that everybody thinks is on the agenda, given the recent um, political shockwave surprises worldwide. So during, um, in the UK, during the European Union referendum campaign and during the recent US presidential campaign, what's for sure is the influence of traditional experts has been challenged. So advice and evidence provided by economists, think tanks, NGOs, and academics has rather been brushed aside in favor of popular opinion based perhaps on emotion rather than facts. So if it's true we're in a world where fake news, alternative facts, and social media echo chambers are becoming the new normal, have the public really had enough of experts? And rather sadly, if that's true, where does it leave us in universities who undertake research and attempt to educate the experts of tomorrow. So that's the kind of theme uh, that we're going to throw around tonight. So let me just briefly then introduce the distinguished panel we have with us, and I'll go left and across. On my left, uh, Sir Richard Dearlove, who's actually the chair of the Board of Trustees for the University of London. So technically, he's my boss, so I have to be rather careful what I say tonight. But I'll say some nice things about him just to uh, so Richard's had a successful and distinguished career in government and in education, 
Uh, he joined the UK Secret Intelligence Services back in 1966 and worked his way up actually to become the chief of MI6 in 1999, retiring from the service in 2004 and then going on to a uh, high level uh, input into education. He was Master of Pembroke College, Cambridge, served as Deputy, uh, <laughs> Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, and now he's Chair of our Board of Trustees in London. On his left, uh, Emmanuel Daniel, who I think many of you in this room will know, founder of the Asian Banker, respected publisher of intelligence reports, what price intelligence reports in an age of non-expertise, on financial services industry in Asian Pacific, Middle East, and other emerging market regions. Highly regarded speaker, provides consulting advice to leading institutions and agencies on developments in industry, associate member of the Asia Society in New York. In 1999 was awarded the prestigious Citibank Excellence in Journalism Award for the Asian for his work on the impact of the internet on banking. Uh, originally a lawyer, Emmanuel's a graduate of National University of Singapore and the University of London. Uh, <laughs> moving to the left, uh, Dr. Mary Stiasny. Uh, Mary has worked uh, in a long career, uh, devoted really to delivering and promoting quality accessible education around the world. Uh, careers in the British Council, uh, prior to becoming the Pro Vice Chancellor International for the University of London International Programs, uh, Mary provided strategic direction and leadership at the Institute of Education, also part of uh, University of London. Uh, then on the far left, uh, Professor Bob O'Keefe uh, is currently Professor of Information Management and Dean of the Faculty of Management, Economics, Law and Vice Principal for External Engagement at one of our federal partner institutions, Royal Holloway uh, University of London. Uh, he's held academic uh, positions at many universities, uh, management colleges, and has had visiting uh, positions in Australia, so big international um, experience. Uh, interests very much at the intersection of modeling, decision support, the application of information technology, present research and consulting interests are in the use of the internet to support customer consumer decision making. So we have a range of experience which I think is highly relevant to the topic that we're trying to debate. Uh, we'll plan to debate um, for as long as it takes, but I think we will break at about 8 o'clock so that we can mingle uh, socially. Um, I hope to leave plenty of time for questions from the floor. So what I want to do is ask each panelist to use up to five minutes uh, to hand us out some of their own personal prejudices. <laughs> the first prejudice comes from Sir Richard. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for that kind introduction. Um, I don't think that the uh, problem of post-truth is particularly new, and my comments really derive largely from my career experience because I spent a lot of my professional life let's say, on the front line of the Cold War. I'll come back to that in a minute. I think what is new is the technological empowerment of individuals, either to inform others or to be informed. And you know, what we refer to as social media really is, tra that's what's transformative. The post-truth concept for me isn't. And I think what's remarkable about social media is its ability to diffuse power away from organizations and, uh, and to empower individuals. Of course, it can work in the reverse direction, but what it has done is to sort of liberate the individual in a way which in the past was completely unimaginable. And one of the monopolies that it has broken completely is the monopoly of the fourth estate of the press. Uh, and I think I would say that in this respect, we're living through a social revolution. And like most revolutions, when they're in their revolutionary phase, they tend to overreach. So I would argue that we are experiencing in that respect overreach. Now let me just go back to why I think that the post-truth issue isn't particularly new. Um, let's say the ideological character of the Soviet Union uh, in the Cold War was basically to, to, to purloin the truth.
if we use that word. I mean, when I see truth, you know, I usually think this is a moral and ethical minefield. Um, and it's a word that generally, if you think about it, doesn't occur much in universities. Words relating to it do, like integrity, honesty, research data, evidence, but the word truth, you know, it doesn't actually feature greatly in, in, in academic debate. Well, that's my personal prejudice or view. Um, but, you know, let, let's take the Soviet Union. They didn't really deal in small lies. They dealt in enormous lies, which were pervade as truth. And I'm not saying the West was innocent in this respect. Um, it did, as it were, on occasion, it was economical with the truth when it wished to be. Um, and, uh, you know, propaganda, therefore, was, was an essential part of that life. We, and we've just tended to overlook this and rather put it to one side. But, you know, the Soviet Union set out to control the narrative that it projected. And, you know, he who, as it were, controls the past, i.e., you know, dominates the history and the story, controls the future. And interestingly, I would say this is a very strong feature of the narrative that lies behind radical Islam. And the idea that, um, you know, traditionally, historically, the narrative of radical Islam is that the Muslim um, religion or the, the believers in the Muslim religion have been victims since the earliest time and victims of the Christian world. And it's these types of um, distortions of the truth that now are so much a feature of um, aspects of social media. And of course, we have a wonderful example sitting in the heart of London University, uh, which is 1984 because the model for the Ministry of Truth was the London University Senate House, as I'm sure you all know, where George Orwell's wife worked. And of course, the Ministry of Truth in, was, was in effect the Ministry of Lies. Uh, and you know, wonderful inventions like the word Newspeak um, come straight out of 1984. So you know, th this is a, is a deep-seated um, problem which has been with us for a long time. And the one thing I like about 1984 was one of the slogans which was to be hung on the Ministry of Truth building was, ignorance is strength. So, um, <laughs> I'm, what I'm pointing to is that a lot of this has been said before. Now, let me just give you a wonderful little anecdote from the world of intelligence. The last head of the Stasi was a man called Mielka. And um, he had the flaws in the Stasi building renumbered. So his office was 101, room 101. <laughs> um, so I think that what we're experiencing is what I would describe as a move from the fourth estate to what we might describe now as the fifth estate. And the fifth estate is, as it were, equally powerful and it lies in the power of social media. And I think what's probably shocking for all of us and of course, we live in a time when we're being delivered some quite severe political shocks, as we hadn't expected uh, the White House um, to become, as it were, uh, one of the fountains of the new fifth estate. And uh, I think that, at the moment, is what we are experiencing. And there is a sort of, let's say, an ideological approach to a view of certain uh, uh, events in the world, which are based more on, let's say, a Bannon view of how the world works rather than on pragmatic evidence. So maybe I've said enough, I think I've used up my five minutes to give you the gist of my particular thinking. I've got a lot more that I could say or want to say. But, um, carry on? No, 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 I, I, no I'll, hand, I'll hand over to you guys. But, um, no, I, I, I I should complete. Well, I pretty much have completed. <laughs> and I, all, all I will say is that I think um, in, the, in academia, we tend to adhere to arguments which philosophically I would describe as entailing. Um, what I mean by that is there is a logic. You can argue against them. You can develop an argument. Non-entailing arguments based on belief are rather final and don't, as it were, encourage uh, dialogue, exchange, nor, as it were, the accumulation of evidence or data to try to prove an argument. So what I'm sort of advocating in the academic environment to 
hold out against this move towards post-truth is entailing arguments. Thank you. The, the story is told of Einstein and his uh, chauffeur. They used to go you know, city after city um, where Einstein gives his speeches. And his chauffeur had heard his speeches so many times that he said, you know what, I can give your speech for you. So they went to a city where nobody recognized the chauffeur or all the, all Einstein and they exchanged places. The chauffeur gave a great speech. Um, and it was, uh, you know, Einstein was sitting in the audience at the back as the driver and, and was very impressed. Then came Q&A session and they, someone asked a particularly difficult question and the chauffeur said, that's a very easy question, even my driver can answer this. <laughs> So, so it's good to be in a distinguished company of chauffeurs here. <laughs> it's like, uh, I've been um, very influenced by um, a, a thinker. His name is David Ronfeld. He uh, from Rand Corporation. In 1996, he wrote a paper called "Tribes, Institutions, Markets, and Networks." Um, essentially, uh, his proposition, and it's been tested, and it helps me in my own thinking is that society evolves from its tribal origins um, into, its, into an institutionalized um, you know, structure. And then comes the markets. Um, and then uh, what we're going into is today the network space, as you would call it. And even in 1996, where the most developed technology was the fax machine, he could envisage a world where the network space was where we will all interact with each other where information was far more transparent than it was then uh, and a whole new ecosystem was developed. And I was able to apply that in the industry that I cover and some of you will remember the LIBOR crisis for example. Um, London Inter Interbank offered rate. It's a rate where bankers get together to determine um, you know, what the shared um, lending rate was for that time. And the LIBOR has its origins in the tribal phase of English society where, um, where you, you had gentlemen who get together in the 1700s waiting for the ships to come in and decided between themselves what, uh, what, how they wanted to price the risk. And that was the phase where the origins of Lloyds of London and so on came. The problem with LIBOR is that in the 1970s it was institutionalized, it was taken over by the uh, Association of Banks. And when the LIBOR crisis was erupting, um, every, in, the, in 2012, um, every day that there was an announcement in London in the evening, uh, the wire services will start the next morning at 8 o'clock in Singapore asking people like me for an opinion so that they could keep talking about it until London opens the next day. And the one question that I was asked is, uh, was, um, what about this duty of care that, uh, that LIBOR owes to the $5 trillion um, FX market. And I said, what duty of care? LIBOR is an institutionalized um, uh, mechanism for interbank lending. And at no point was there ever that duty of care between the institutional phase of, of the industry's development with the market space. And if we all understand markets better, today markets are voracious in, the, in, the, in looking for indices that they can trade on. And you could have indices on the price of potatoes, um, on, on tomorrow's uh, papayas, um, harvest, uh, and you would not know that you have a duty care of care for, uh, or to the markets. And in fact, it was three years before the first prosecution took place, and it was four years before a prosecution that involved both the traders and the rate setters took place where that duty of care was established. In fact, in 2008, when, when Wall Street Journal first wrote that paper um, uh, detecting that, that the rate setters were in collusion with the market players, um, the governor of the Bank of England um, said something. He said, the, the rate at which banks lend, to, uh, this is, uh, LIBOR is the rate at which banks don't lend to each other. Uh, that's how he dismissed it in 2008, and, and then came 2012. So with this at the background, what is this idea that we have uh, that we call the expert? In the tribal phase, the expert would be the shaman, the, the religion elder, the chief, the person who aggregates all the information in the village. In the institutional phase, it's always that institution which is one step removed from how society functions, the church, 
the university, um, and and so on, and um, and uh, um, and and the management consultant, and we call them experts, although they are not exactly practitioners in the regard. But by the time we reach the markets phase, experts tend to start getting a negative connotation. We call traders experts. We call market makers experts, brokers experts. Even in that phase when European society was evolving from its Middle Ages to Renaissance, um, it was the trader, the, pe the people who were networking, who were wealth creators, who generated the wealth that the, um, that the institutionalized part of society depended on. By the time we reach the network phase, who is the expert? We don't like this even more. It is the blogger. It is the, the people who wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and aggregate all the information that is around them. And in today, even among my friends, I have friends who blog so uh, voraciously that their credibility is based on the fact that they are bloggers. And, and when we think about Brexit, Actually, it was a blogger who created the whole agenda because uh, in the time when the UK was not paying attention, there was one young man who went over to Brussels and was filing stories back to the UK for any newspaper that would take it on um, and started to create the agenda that, that, that the UK was being governed by a group of non-elected officials who were telling them um, how to run their lives, everything from the price of eggs to um, electricity. Uh, and that blogger, event, if you call a freelance writer a blogger at that time, eventually became the mayor of, of London. And when that agenda, Brexit agenda, was thrust on him, he could not take it because he was also one step removed from the, the whole mechanism by which uh, um, society made that decision. So Boris Johnson uh, is someone that um, you know, we, 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 we think about. Um, and in the way that I think about the, this evolution, uh, I see the, the rise of the blogger-in-chief today, the President of the United States, as being right on cue. Uh, he has arrived at a time uh, when this evolution has now uh, uh, you know, arrived at the, uh, at, at, at the face of society's evolution in the network phase. Then what is truth? What is truth in this room? Some of us are Christians, some of us are Muslims, some of us believe that gays are a medical condition, some of us make an entire argument that there is no God, and we are a very polite conglomeration of people who believe that we all agree what truth is. And then we, we then assign truth to the institutions, and we like to think that the institutions, like the universities, carry that truth for us. And that when we talk about truth, which has to do with um, inassailable truth, like science, that, that all of us are in agreement about, um, about what truth is. Think about this, that when Isaac Newton had that apple fall on the, from the tree, and he imagined all of the uh, thinking behind gravity and how the planets held together and, and eventually that became used to put rockets in space and so on, he was discovering truth. In fact, the, the biologist Rupert Sheldrake Sh Sheldrake, Sheldrake. Sheldrake yeah, um, makes this distinction between um, truth as a uh, science as a process of inquiry and science as a belief. When a university generates thousands of students who believe that gravity is 9.807 meters per second, you are actually generating a whole generation of people who did not question the fact that gravity is actually an average of data that's collected from different parts of the world, or that the speed of light is 299 million, <coughs> square, uh, million meters per second, that that figure was imagined by an, uh, a committee in 1971 that finally decided that the speed of light should be, or rather the meter should be uh, measured against this, um, the, the wavelength of light. So the, the interesting thing about um, truth as we know it is that we, we deal with it to the level at which we are comfortable. What troubles me um, as a layperson is that 
the liberal right seems to de decide that it has the, the right to decide what truth is today. In fact, if you go to the bookshops today, all the books being written, post-truth society, who gave us the right to call this post-truth? Um, you know, um, and, and um, you know, books uh, which I've, I've been collecting on, um, seems to be that they want to decide the agenda uh, and, and that they themselves should be the determinant in terms of how we, we ne negotiate this process. And it's not an easy process to negotiate. Just think about this. When society was moving from its tribal to its institutional phase, that young teenage girl who leaves her tribal home to go to school in town where the healthcare is taken care of, where education is highly structured, goes back to her parents and, and the kind of animosity that's created and the, the, the tension that's created in what truth is and, and how much of what is tribal can be carried into the institutional phase. And in that way, we have that problem replicated again and again. So in this society, we've now arrived at a point where we've institutionalized a lot of structure that we are comfortable with. Unfortunately for Singapore today, we are now on another journey, a journey from a highly institutionalized phase to the market space and the network space. The government asks us to do this. Society asks us to do this. Our children will, will make us do this even if we didn't want to because the future is uh, you know, knocking on our doors. And it's not going to be a polite phase. When, when you start to um, you know, proscribe that institutions cannot be questioned and cannot be, um, you know, cannot be tested, you actually make it a lot more difficult to make that transition into the new phase. So these are my initial comments. So we're in a, we are in a post truth world, they say. The public doesn't trust experts anymore, they say. And we seem to be in a new world where knowledge or the possession thereof has no or little value, they say. This is quite challenging for those of us who work in universities, and especially for somebody like me, who first trained as a teacher and taught in a secondary school, and then for over 30 years of my life have trained people to become secondary school teachers. And I work in a university now which is committed to access, to enabling students wherever they are in the world, whoever they are, whatever their race, class, gender, sexuality, to study, to find, as we used to say, the keys to knowledge. Is this now valueless? Is it worthless? No, it's not, because I maintain, of course, there are different knowledges, there are different truths. Your truth may not be my truth, and we've heard versions of this already. So why do I continue to do what I do? to enable students all over the world to study. How, previously, could I justify training teachers to teach young minds? Because I believe that it's my duty, my responsibility, to give others the chances I have had, to enable them to access the keys of knowledge. And perhaps that's the point. We don't say, come to our university and we'll teach you the one and only body of knowledge, the truth. What we say is, study with us and we'll show you the bodies of knowledge which we know, which are available, and we'll give you, hopefully, or we'll try to give you, or we'll do our best to give you, the keys to that knowledge, the skills, the understandings, and hopefully the discernment to access those knowledges and make of them what you can. Because knowledge itself, without the skills, the understanding, the creativity as well, which go with it, is pretty empty, pretty sterile. We can all go to Google now. It's incredibly easy. And students increasingly do that rather than go to the library. <laughs> or we can look at Wikipedia. That's also very easy. Or we can read people's views expressed as truth on Twitter or a blog. And we've heard about that. What matters, though, is whether we care to understand what we find and what we care to do with what we find. Because without the skills of understanding, experience, and creativity, I don't think we'll get very far. I think we go round in circles. When I was training teachers, 
and I suppose I trained hundreds of them, we had some pretty amazing students. Some of them had first class degrees. Some of them had doctorates. But unless and until and if, in some cases, it didn't work for everybody, they could develop the skills and understandings of what, when, how, and why to work with young people to enable them in their turn to develop the skills, understandings, discernments towards the facts, the knowledges, and the truths around us, then it was pretty meaningless. And those student teachers remained ineffectual teachers, to be honest. <coughs> Excuse me. So, coming back to the question, are we in a post-truth age? <coughs> Question first, yes, just wait. Is the expert dead? <laughs> I don't claim to be an expert, but you never know. <laughs> I would argue that we need them just as we always have. We need to learn, we need to study, we need to develop ourselves, but it's not just about one body of knowledge. It's about developing the, school, the, the tools, the skills, and the understandings, and the creativity, to say it again, and the discernment, perhaps most of all the discernment, so that we know what your truth is, or at least know that your truth might not be my truth, that your opinions might be different from mine, but that facts are facts, and there aren't, I would argue, any alternative facts. <laughs> Maybe interpretations differ, but facts don't. Real experts are those who have knowledge, but more, they know how to use that knowledge. <coughs> <coughs> on the way here, I flew out here on overnight on, on Monday night, I watched a film on the plane coming to Singapore, and it was a film about a court battle between two experts. Some of you may have seen it denial. One expert was, is a Holocaust denier. And that expert took the other, a Jewish historian, to court because she had accused him in a book <coughs> of falsifying his evidence, the evidence behi behind his assertions. He had assembled a myriad of facts, but, and the court proved this in the end, misrepresented those facts and presented them as truth, the truth, and used that truth in a skewed way. The Jewish historian won her case because the key ingredient, I would argue in all of this, that we need to build into this whole debate is integrity of knowledge. As a teacher trainer, coming back to my, role, origina my original role, it's no good knowing the evidence about how young people learn best if we cover up the truth about it, about how they learn and study best, and then fail, because we're covering up the truth, fail those young people for whom we have responsibility. The University of London's commitment <coughs> is to enable people to access knowledge, <coughs> and we ask our graduates to use it wisely. Today we've been at graduation ceremonies, and this afternoon I spoke at the graduation ceremony. I did cough a lot, but I spoke. <laughs> One of the things I said today at the ceremony was, to quote, the problems facing our world are complex, distressing, urgent. Inquisitive, tolerant, and generous minds are needed to tackle these problems. <coughs> Sorry. I personally believe that a University of London degree helps to foster those values in its students. As such, I said to them, I hope that you, our current generation of graduates, will use what you have learned during your degree to help and inspire us all to make the world the better place we know it can be, to have discernment and to have integrity. 
Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, Mary and I were discussing our coughs just before the talk, and uh, um, I, we, we're going to see afterwards who coughs more. I, I think, and I think you've won already. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, extra time for that one. Um, the difficulty with being at the end of something like this is generally people have already said very sensible things that you might have said. Um, so I'll see if I can avoid doing that. Yeah, it, it was mentioned that we don't much mention truth within universities. We do, however, spend quite a bit of time uh, teaching and studying <laughs> epistemology, the philosophy of knowledge. And there we try and work with students to understand what an argument is, how difficult truth can be, and how we move from simple assertions that people make to turning these into things that can be tested, sometimes called hypotheses. And these tend to involve an area of measurement. And if anybody here has done a PhD or perhaps certainly a master's degree, you would have done some epistemology uh, along the way, probably under the banner of research methods, but you would have done it. I must say many students don't like studying research methods and they don't like it when you start using big words like epistemology, <laughs> but, but you'd have done that anyway. I think one of the interesting issues we have at the moment is politicians and others make assertions and then these days have a tendency to go and choose the measurement they want to be able to test their assertions. And in part it's because there's so many things we can measure. So if you look at Brexit in the UK, the sitting government very much pursued an argument that the economy is growing. And therefore, given we have a strong growing economy, why would we leave the EU? Now, in terms of that assertion, you need a measurement to be able to test it. And politicians will talk about GDP, gross domestic product, or GDP per capita, or some variant thereof. If you're sitting in a community where your disposable income has not increased for a number of years, uh, national GDP is meaningless to you. And certainly in the UK, we had many communities where people could look around, they could pick their measure, my neighbor's well-being, my neighbor's disposable income, and conclude that for them, the assertion didn't hold, the economy was not growing. And they went to the ballot box and essentially voted almost against that assertion of a growing economy. On the other side, um, I think things were even worse. So we had assertions such as the UK is better off outside the EU. Uh, many politicians were unable to define what better off meant and to be come up with an appropriate measure that could be tested. Uh, we had a figure of 350 million bandied around. Would we be better off by 350 million pounds a week outside the EU with very, very little um, explanation of where that measurement came from and how you might test it. One of the reasons I think our measurement and testing of assertions is so bad now is because of the speed of which things move. So if you are uh, an academic, an economist, you like to take an assertion, think through your measurements, and go and test it with the best data you can find. Typically, a year later, you come out with something that tells you whether this is a good assertion or not. The speed of politics, the speed of social media, means that we keep shortchanging these activities. We make assertions, we come up with measurements, we Google it to find a bit of a test, and then we present the assertion. So it's getting very difficult to do things at the speed that social media leaves us. 
Um, how do we get around this? How, how do we change things? Now, I'm very tempted to say that we should teach more epistemology to students. Um, that would not go down well, certainly, with the students I teach. But I feel that in education we have probably driven things too much towards what might be called the vocational side of education. We teach people skills, but in doing so, we avoid to develop other skills in them. And I think this is very much around what Mary was talking about. So we teach people epistemology, we teach people statistics, we teach people how to test things but we're not very good at educating people in how to deal with uncertainty. I have a little um, bee in my bonnet. One of my prejudices is that I think education is not broad enough these days. I'm of a generation where at school we all studied history, we all knew some geography, we were all made to read great literature. And although I went off and studied maths and sciences, I think personally that gave me a background and an understanding about behaviours, about uncertainties. It really worries me when we take students through skills courses and they start off with learning how to put PowerPoint slides together. Um, if they're lucky after, you know, and the next thing is how to do an executive summary. You know, these are useful skills, but they are not the skills you need to really understand uncertainty and really understand some of the complexities of the modern world. And I would argue that we need to return at least slightly to a more traditional education base where people think through what is an assertion, how are we going to measure it, how will we test it with that measurement? And does any of this look like a truth? And if it does look like a truth, whose truth is it? What assumptions have I made along the way that means that this might be my truth and not other people's truth? Thank you. I think the way I'd like to proceed now would be to get a few thoughts and, and questions from the audience and then toss it to and fro again. But it seems to me one of, one of the themes that emerges from this is the distinction between, if you like, processes of thought and wh where those processes of thought end up. So the things that end up, we might call beliefs or truths or whatever, and I think we'd acknowledge there's a, a, an infinity of those and we can't say which one is right per se. But maybe could we have more agreement about what constitute acceptable or with integrity processes of thought? Maybe that's where we can reside. And that's epistemology, I guess. <laughs> anyway, we have some roving mics. And um, could, can we... Somebody wave who wants to set the ball rolling. But one over here, all the mics are heading in the other direction. OK, keep going. Yes, go. Hi, uh, my name is Yvonne. I'm a lawyer. Um, I just have a quick question. A lot of what was discussed today was um, sort of aimed at the educated elite, people who have gone to university, um, people who are taught to think in a certain way. And also in uh, like channels like the BBC, which are quite impartial, these are also, again, ed aimed at people who are able to think critically what is being done um, or what can be done to the large majority of people who are unable to think, think in this, oh sorry, um, who are not trained to think in this certain way. <laughs> uh, people who are maybe um, of a lower income gap, social gap, a social um, level, what can be done? Who would like to, um, so in the, in the old days they would have listened to experts, but now the, the that's the, that's the problem, isn't it? Do you want to...? Uh, I'm rather foxed by the question in terms of what can be done, because, I mean, what can be done 
is probably, I mean, the, the access to that group is through the media, probably. I mean, through television, through radio, um, to an extent through social media as well, in that, you know, the mobile phones and uh, related devices are ubiquitous. Um, and I suppose what one is stressing is the fundamental link between education and the media and having uh, I mean if you actually go back to the original chart of the BBC <laughs> interestingly um, it was as it were conceived of having originally an educational purpose as much as it had a purpose for entertainment um, but you know in, in a commercialized market driven society these original ideas tend to get obliterated by you know the need for profitability and, and so I think it's an extremely good question and you know it's rather vexed as to how you solve the problem I, and, and I mean you've put your finger actually on an essential point I mean I don't know whether any of you have read this book um, called uh, Hillbilly Elegy which is by an American sociologist well actually he's not he, 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 he's an educated sociologist but it, it's about as it were the deprived lifestyle um, in the sort of remote areas of the United States and and it, it is a most revealing and extraordinary book because actually it is revealing the problem of, of sort of ignorance and deprivation and how you actually break out of this cycle and in in a manner what you're asking is you know how we steer uh, large masses of the population and that does sound very sort of patronizing but that's really what it's about out of you know uh, positions of ignorance where they're likely to make uh, erroneous judgments. I mean, the only thing I would say is that, I, I mean, I do personally have a fundamental belief in democracy largely coming up with the right answers, even though they might be contrary answers at certain points in time. And, you know, it does have a reasonably good record. There are some dreadful democratic decisions historically, um, but they're usually explicable. And um, I mean, I agree with what you said about the Trump phenomenon. I mean, it does unfortunately reflect aspects of the world in which we live. And you know, uh, the adaption to the pheno phenomenon, which you're already beginning to see happen politically, both in the United States and beyond. I mean, I, but you know, where are we going to end up? I mean, I suppose I'm posing a question back to you. <laughs> Actually, the, the, the cat is out of the bag. Um, we underestimate the amount of knowledge that's already out there. Um, ten years ago, if you watched a, a, pro, um, a demonstration in Indonesia on CNN, they'll all be incoherent. Today, they'll all have English signboards, and they can take interview questions. They know exactly what their problems are. They understand the hot button words. They know how to connect with a global audience. And these are village people. Um, and these are also people who, when they go and see their doctors, um, if they're diagnosed with cancer, they look up Google and they ask questions, which irritates the doctors to heavens because by, you know, it's like, please, with a little bit of knowledge, don't try and ask me questions that you won't understand the answers for. So um, we now live in a world where knowledge is in the hands of the masses who are handling it with at different levels of competencies. And the strange thing is that it's in the US where, where the level of competency is actually probably the lowest um, uh, because of the kind of media they get and, and stuff like that. Uh, and in, there are countries like the Philippines, for example, with such a uh, you know, difficult education system, it still throws up um, young people with enough skills um, you know, to be part of the global workforce. Um, so there is a pushback on the, front, on the part of the so-called experts in that they find a lot of the expertise are institutionalized expertise and they have difficulty relating to the knowledge that's been created um, at the informal aspect of society. Um, and so we need to find that, that bridge. Okay. My colleagues wouldn't mind if we don't all answer every Question. 
If I could ask the panel, what is the moral responsibility of post-secondary education to promote the liberal arts over the discrete skills belonging to all of these professions that students are moving into? They're not encouraged to pursue the dispositions that elementary and secondary schools want to promote around 21st century uh, learning. You go to the MRT, you go to the billboards, it's, you know, your MBA, it's, you know, your commerce degree. Those are what's the values in society. I never see uh, any promotion of come and join our liberal arts and let's discuss the human condition. <laughs> yes. So, so I'm taking that one, am, am I? Um, which, which, which is a great one to take. Royal Holloway is the, is, is the only university in the UK which was originally formed on the model of an American liberal arts college. Um, its original curriculum back in the 80, 80s was literally stolen from Vassar. They went over there on a trip, they saw the curriculum, they liked it, they brought it back. Uh, we have spent some time trying to move back towards a more liberal arts type curriculum. So we actually reintroduced a liberal arts degree a couple of years ago. We're trying to do things such as build in much more service-based learning, as the American colleges call it, where you go out and do things in the community and learn. The, the, one of the things that makes it difficult for us is, firstly, parents who want their kids to get jobs. So law, accounting, medicine, whatever, tends to take the lion's share of student applications. And the second thing is what's happening in schools, where certainly within the UK, the schools feel so driven by league tables and so driven by results. And um, gee, I guess it's a bit like that in Singapore as well. <laughs> uh, that they are fast tracking students into areas where they get the results. So if you're really good at maths, you do maths, maths, and more maths, because that helps us get up the league tables. You don't necessarily do maths, economics, and English literature, because that's really difficult, and it's not going to help us going forward. So I think we have an obligation to think more about how we teach students and how we do things, and how we broaden out their learning and their learning experience. Um, I won't mention epistemology again. I, I, I nearly did. But I essentially, I think that's a key part of what we do. And I would, but I would come back to this notion. Uh, within the UK, if you look at applications for universities, you know, numbers for law, applications for law, medicine, business studies, psychology, which is seen as having a job at the end of it, are. are, are uh, Sorry, that wasn't meant to be funny. <laughs> that, that just how it's perceived by applicants as, as, as practical base. You know, applications are still growing. Applications for humanities are going down. Nobody wants to study for sociology. Keeping sociology programs um, is really difficult. The interesting thing, when I talk to people at the other end of universities, so when I talk to people running accounting firms, they say, oh, we've had enough of hiring accounting graduates. We've had enough of hiring business graduates. We really like classics graduates, drama graduates. Our music graduates do really well in the marketplace because they've developed a certain set of skills and an ability to work hard. So at the employment side, I think there is a real demand for people who are much broader and can think about things and are much more critical the problem in universities is at the entry side, getting parents and students to understand that. You can come and do liberal arts, and in so doing, you might be even better positioned to go on and do something in business than if you do a business degree. And it's very, very difficult at the front end to work with parents and students to do that. Okay, I'm going to 
use my chairman's role to move us on, except I'm going to say something, because this problem we've confronted in the University of London, we actually have in our School of Advanced Study a professor whose title is Professor of the Public Understanding of the Humanities. And we launched two years ago a festival called Being Human. It started in London, it spread through the UK, we're now going international and parts of the Being Human Festival will be here in Singapore next year. So when you go home, Google Being Human Festival, University of London, and you'll get some answers to the question. Next question. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Raymond, uh, ex-professor. Um, very concerned about the QS ranking, Times ranking, Guardian ranking. You know, it confuses a lot of young people these days. All right. Um, to me, um, I always advise students uh, to, or learners, all right, to look at universities with their core strength in the specific discipline that they want to endeavor. But some of these universities will never make it to the grade of uh, Oxford and Cambridge that is always occupying the, the first two ranking. All right. um, for University of London, uh, I, they are, I, I have tried your system before, all right, your, the, the degree programs, and they are good. Um, but the thing is that the that ranking within U of London it is still not there. <laughs> All right. So I would like to know from you guys: um, is there anything uh, that you are doing that will help to promote the ranking of UOL uh, besides UCL? UCL has got very good reputation. <laughs> that is one thing. The other thing I have I've tested. I'm with City Law School. All right. Um, the program is very well structured. I can do a, pre, uh, a postgraduate anywhere on earth, and I still can as access to the assessment platform. But some of these degrees that are postgraduate, you need to be at a certain place at a certain time. And that makes it very difficult for people like me that travels around the world all right, to go and find an examination center to, to, to take an exam. All right? uh, so, I, I'm actually concerned about uh, if there's any way to make it, especially for postgraduate program, to make it more flexible so that we can be assessed anywhere around the world and take as many subjects as possible, including liberal arts, all right? And, uh, and, and still can learn something new uh, as a lifelong learner. Okay, it's a, it's a bit specific about the operations of University of London, but why don't you do a, a quick one, Mary? And then the two of you will get together over a drink, and Mary will answer the <laughs> answer the question completely. Yeah, let, should we do that? Yeah. Okay. So questions about the the main topic, but uh, it's, what you said is interesting. We'll deal with it later. There are answers to your questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm Yin Tong. I'm an accountant by training. Uh, can we get back to uh, fake news and and the truth? Uh, you may know that the Singapore government is addressing the issue of fake news. Uh, they're thinking of enhancing laws and passing new laws uh, to bring the recalcitrants to justice. You know. uh, in, in the panel's view, uh, do you think laws, even if draconian, would be effective in countering fake news? Uh, perhaps I put this question to Emmanuel and perhaps the M out there who's uh, been involved in the Cold War. So, so this, <laughs> is, this, is an, this is an academic discourse, not, not a political one, so please tell the truth. Okay. Mary first. <laughs> I think it's a huge task, isn't it? And certainly the German government, if we go back to the film I was talking about, the German government has passed a law that people who deny the Holocaust will be imprisoned. The Austrian government has a similar sort of law. So in terms of fake information, they do have those laws Ooh. and they do implement them and they hold that very dear and very important and a matter of honor. I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but that's one way that some governments have dealt with fake news and misinformation. Um, I, I must say instinctively, I would feel extremely 
awkward about legislating on an issue like fake news. Um, I mean, I think the tradition of the common law is that probably, if you think about it hard enough, the legal instruments already exist to prosecute you know, violations, natural violations which have a, you know, an outrageous consequence. So, I mean, I would probably go down that track. I, I mean, legislating about fake news has inside it, you know, control of news. You're, you're actually doing the opposite to achieve the opposite. And I think that's probably a rather dangerous step. Um, and it, it, for me, uh, don't be offended by this, it's a too authoritarian approach. <laughs> Um, it's actually the, 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 the questions you asked um, has, a, has a, a wide, broader um, connotation because um, a lot of governments and regulators and so on are thinking about cyber security as a whole. And in cyber security, um, when, when institutions, whether it's banks or large companies, when they were thinking about cyber security, they thought that it was about closing the door. That is, how do you close the door on the criminals? The problem is you need that same door to relate with your customers. And the more you interact, the, the higher the risk that arises. Uh, in fact, one of the interesting things about fake news is, I, I mean, groups uh, where I'm with my ex-classmates and so on, I was surprised at how people with my background have problems identifying news. Um, when they see something, they can't tell that it's fake. Um, the problem there is that you, you are going to be exposed to more and more uh, information, and that skill for understanding or distinguishing between fake and truth is something that potentially society will evolve its own skills and its own mechanisms that will help people understand it uh, instinctively. Uh, because I, I don't think you can put a door to it. Um, um, and so now thinking on cybersecurity and on, um, on fake news is that uh, you need to be exposed to more of it and then start to detect the trends from there. We'll take one more question and then when we go along the road, the panel can use that excuse to quickly sum up any thoughts they've had because we do want plenty of time for you to network outside. So who's got the last question? Okay, the lady there wins. <laughs> Um, I've been mulling over this question for a long time. I'm an NUS graduate. Um, I started off with a more liberal arts kind of education during my O levels and A levels, but of course, commerce trumps, parents' wishes trumps, so I did an economics degree. Um, the question I was going to say uh, to put to the panel was this Do you think that academia has shot yourselves? in the foot um, and, and lost some credibility in terms of the monopoly of truth, if you may, because of the fact that it's also a, quite a dog-eat-dog's world in academia. You are pushed to um, publish papers, garner citations in order to have a better hold on your tenureship. And therefore, sometimes, we create this confusion in the world where um, one expert publishes a paper on drinking wine is good for your heart and some other person publishes another paper and says, no, it would actually ha hasten uh, a heart attack. So my point is, is that a problem that the academia has produced for itself? Um, basically, corner yourself, paint yourself into a corner and perhaps at the end of the day, it's something that academia can solve because it is, in fact, academia trying to behave um, like a market-driven world. Okay. Clear question. Let's come along the row and, and everybody gets their final one minute. Right. So um, your, your answer very much reminded me of a colleague of mine who was involved in a nationwide study looking at uh, advertising alcohol and the effect of young people. Uh, a very long, very in-depth study, and when it was released, it got a lot of press. The anti-alcohol level 
uh, sorry, the anti-alcohol body quickly leapt on the study as demonstrating that we should not be advertising alcohol to young people. The drinks producers quickly leapt on the study as demonstrating that there was no bad effects in viewing, um, in viewing alcohol advertising. And that issue on what you've said nicely sums up academia. Our job is not to stand there and say, these are the findings, this is the truth, but to help and educate people so they can do it for themselves. So they can take their views and beliefs and their knowledge and come to their own conclusions. Even if at the end of those days, some of those conclusions might be different. I have a real beef at the moment and an issue with colleagues of mine who insist on still going into lectures, telling the students to turn their phones off, and then trying, often through hundreds of PowerPoint slides, to demonstrate a single truth, a single belief. I think those days are gone. I think you have to accept that everybody has access to knowledge, to, to what, to them are facts, etc and then educate people in a way to be able to use all of it in one go. We don't hold a single version of the truth anymore. The reality is we never did. I think sometimes we unfortunately would pretend that we did, but we never did. I would agree with absolu absolutely with that. Yeah. I think it's about how we work with our students, how we work with ourselves to, as I said earlier, to develop the skills and understandings yeah and the discernment and the integrity to work with the information that we have and the knowledge we have. I think one of the problems for universities, and people have said this from the audience, problems for universities and indeed for schools as well, in the way that, that we are, are seen is the way we're presented in league tables. And I think that has characterized us and actually distorted some of our behaviors. It may be we've brought some of that on ourselves and I'll have a conversation with you about league tables afterwards. But we may well have brought that on in part by ourselves, but it's also in some ways happened to us as well. It's what matters is how we deal with that. But what also matters is what really goes on in universities. And I think what happens in league tables distorts and, and, and obscures that, to be quite honest. We've got all the way along the line. All the way, okay. Um, the thing that um, uh, I'm concerned most about academia is the way in which it's moved from the process of inquiry, and I think publishing and, and peer reviews and so on are very healthy, um, even if it's a very you know, small-minded world where <coughs> professors just worry about what other professors think and so on, to a world where you have clusters of engineering professors um, you know, rushing to uh, you know, do patents in order to block out um, you know, processes that others can't use. In fact, if anything, I, I see the university culture ossifying. Um, in order not to ossify, it needs to evolve from an institutional type of an arrangement to a markets environment to a networked world, as I tried to describe earlier. And as that happens, they have to be agnostic as to who they relate to. It's not just within academia. Yes, with industry, but also with pseudo-academics. In fact, that's a, that's a whole ecosystem that um, people who um, work in business but who, whose contribution to knowledge building um, is very much a, you know, a, a thought authentic thing that they need to be taken into account. Um, and the validation doesn't come from the system. It actually comes from the network. It comes from individuals. And that's the world we are going towards. I think we have to be positive about that. Uh, I think that the phrase that has already been mentioned, particularly by Mary, and sticks in my mind is integrity, really. And uh, I mean, I think if you ask me about the responsibilities of higher education in a world which is going in a difficult and dangerous direction, particularly in relation to the media. It is that we should be purveyors of intellectual integrity. And that there will obviously, within that scenario, it doesn't rule out mistakes, it doesn't rule out fundamental disagreements, it doesn't rule out argument, 
that if you know we uh, try to achieve in terms of our own uh, academic endeavours intellectual integrity and encourage standards of integrity in those whom we have a responsibility of teaching, I think that is probably the best that we can deliver. I mean, there's no question that the state's approach, and I mean all states' approach to higher education, there's a strong aspect of social engineering in that. And that in itself puts enormous responsibility on the state, but if as it were, its currency is based on integrity. Uh, I think this, as it were, militates against a lot of the built-in dangers. I think we could sit here for another hour and a half and still be spellbound by our own thoughts. Um, but I'm going to draw this part of the evening to a close because we want to give you some refreshments and the ability to network. We will all be there. We can continue the, the conversations. But I don't think the gallery will let us stay here all night. <laughs> so if, if we don't break into that second phase, now we won't. But perhaps you could join me in thanking our panelists, and we look forward to seeing you.